Hey, everybody. Uh, Welcome back to our study of 1 Corinthians. We're in chapter 4 tonight. Hope you have your Bibles open or your Bible app on your phone. Uh, It's going to help you a whole lot more if you're reading along with me. But thanks for spending time with me in the Word. I hope this is going to be fruitful for you. It sure is for me, and I enjoy doing it with you. Um, So, again, we're in 1 Corinthians 4, and you might recall if you've been with us so far, Paul is writing to the church in the Greek city of Corinth, a church that has a lot of problems, a lot of very specific issues that they have written Paul a letter asking him to address. And he's going to start next chapter in chapter five, and we'll get into it next week. He's going to start addressing those specific issues then. But for now, he's essentially started his letter by saying, listen, you think you got problems, but you didn't even address your main problem. Your main problem is your lack of unity. Your main problem is you're split into factions over which particular preacher of the gospel you think is most effective and who you're most loyal to. And so that just shows us how important unity is in the New Testament church that Paul would take up the first four chapters of his letter to address this one issue. Essentially, a quarter of the letter is devoted to unity. That's how important it is to the Apostle Paul how important it is to the Holy Spirit who inspired him and how important our church's unity should be to us. Uh, So he's going to close out that section on unity in chapter four by talking about the main thing that gets in the way, and that's arrogance. Now, arrogance we see especially in our tendency to judge other people. We like to put people in categories, and we do this in a variety of ways. Think about families. Uh, In every family, there's a a member of the family that you consider the funny one or the hardworking one, the the one who can't get anything right. And if you grew up in a family where you were uh, disrespected, that can be crippling. That can be devastating. Uh, So psychologists have had a field day on this whole idea of family systems. But that comes from this arrogant desire to just be able to judge people. Think about politics. Okay, I'm going to wake everybody up right now. Um, in, in a political context, we love to put people into categories and just based on one thing we've heard them say, d- decide that we know who they are and what they're about. So people on the left will look at someone and say, hey, you didn't use the proper terminology that we have approved. So therefore, you're a racist or therefore you're a homophobe. And then people on the right come back and they say, wait, 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 you used terminology that we don't agree with. Therefore, you're a Marxist. Therefore, you're someone who hates America and all she stands for. And we talk about this idea of cancel culture. That's that's a big issue today, especially on social media. This idea that anybody we disagree with, they say something we don't like, we're going to cancel them. We're going to make sure that no one can ever hear them again. Uh, and and so people on the right are speaking out against cancel culture, but it goes both ways. Remember the Dixie Chicks a few years ago? They made one statement that a lot of us disagreed with, and their careers were essentially over. Uh, so. Again, I just woke you up, didn't I, by bringing up politics. What I'm trying to say to you is there's no room for that kind of attitude within the church. Now, you might say to me, Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged. That's a verse that is often misunderstood. I want to share something with you that comes from a devotional I read this morning by a Christian author, Sky Jatani. And he talked about that verse, judge not lest you be judged. And he pointed out that in Hebrew thought, the term judge had two different meanings. It can mean to discern, to look at someone and figure out what they really mean. And are they speaking truth? And are they a a good person? On the other hand, it can mean condemn. Jesus wasn't saying we shouldn't be discerning. If that's the truth, then the Bible is making an error when it says we should judge our pastors and teachers and make sure that they're teaching us true doctrine. Uh, Then it's wrong if you and I find out that our kid's babysitter has a criminal record of abusing children and we tell her, I'm not going to use you anymore. She could come back and say, wait, you're not supposed to judge me. Well, of course we do. We're discerning. We're, We're doing what's right. Discerning is one thing. Condemning is another. It's one thing to for, for another example, if you were to come to me and say, Jeff, I saw you uh, the other day out with your kids and you were really ugly to them. And I, I wanted to come and confront you and say, you need to change your attitude. That's a godly response. That's, that's holding me accountable. That's being discerning. On the other hand, if you see me losing my temper with my kids in public and you decide uh, Jeff can't possibly be a Christian 
I'm going to write him off. I'm going to consign him in my own mind to the fires of hell. That's con- that's condemning. Again, that's that's kind of the spiritual version of canceling. I you said or did something I find offensive, and therefore I will not. I, I will consider you a non-person. I, I have no uh, no thought of you anymore. No no feeling of affection or loyalty to you anymore. So when Jesus said, "Judge not, lest you be judged," he wasn't saying. Stop being discerning and be a naive person who believes anybody. He was saying, don't condemn someone else because there's plenty of things they could condemn in you. Now, long, long uh, introduction here, I know. But here in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul is hitting head on this whole arrogance that leads us to judge others. Because again, he's talking about a church in which people are arguing over which apostle is the best one and which one we need to be loyal to. And it's dividing the church. And he just got finished in chapter three by saying, don't give yourself to any human teacher. So he picks up that thread with verse one of chapter four. And this is how it goes. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Notice Paul Paul compares preachers of the gospel, apostles, ministers, to servants of Christ. That's a, that's a word that essentially means bond slaves and stewards of the mysteries of God. So steward, a steward was a manager. Uh, in the ancient world, it might be a slave also, but it was whoever a wealthy person would entrust with keeping track of his finances and distributing funds as needed. You know, this person uh, is someone who I owe money to. And so the steward is going to write him a check. Uh, this is my child. The steward's going to make sure he has enough to eat or drink. And that's what a steward did. For a minister of the gospel, we're a steward of the mysteries of God. So our resource that we distribute is the gospel, the truth that gets people saved. He goes on and says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not hereby thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. So the, the key point that Paul's making here is the only person whose opinion really matters is God. And you as my congregation may judge me, and of course you do. And you are to be discerning. If I speak false doctrine, then you should reject me as a teacher, but not condemn me discerning, but not condemning. Paul says, it doesn't really matter what you think of me as an apostle, Corinthians. All that matters is God. Paul says, I can't even judge myself. I'm doing the best I can. I think I'm doing a good job, but I won't really know until the end The end comes and I stand before Jesus. And that's when I get my final verdict. I'm not worried about my salvation, but on that day, I find out whether I was a faithful servant, a faithful steward or not. So honestly, it really doesn't matter what you think of me. What matters is that final verdict. And then he says in verse five, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So Paul's saying we all ought to live this way. We all ought to live in such a way that I don't judge someone else. I can judge their their actions and their words so I know whether they're telling truth or not, whether I can trust them or not, but I do not judge their final destiny. I do not judge their worth as a human. Uh, Again, if you're my babysitter, my kid's babysitter, and I find that I can't trust you as a babysitter, I'm not going to call you to sit my kids anymore, but I still am required to love you. I'm still required to, to see you as a person of worth and beauty who's created in God's image. We need to live in such a way that we're living for our final exam and we're judging other people that same way with that same grace. That same understanding that, you know, I, I've learned that I can't trust this person, but I also can't condemn them. And, and in the end, God's going to judge all of us, and I'm going to let him do that judging. And, and he's going to decide our eternal destiny. And by the way, let me, before I move on, just from a self-serving standpoint, let me just say, if you want to pray for me or any pastor, there's a lot of ways you can pray for us, pray for our families, pray for wisdom, pray for courage. But this this passage kind of inspires me to share another way you can pray for us. And that is pray that your pastor and ministers would be able to overlook 
the thoughts and attitudes, the, the opinions, the judgments of everybody. In other words, as a pastor, I'm going to be at my best when I'm not trying to make you happy when I'm not trying to impress you, when I'm not trying to satisfy you, when I'm not trying to make you like me, uh, when I just give up all of that and say, hey, the only thing that really matters, the only judgment that matters at all is the judgment of Jesus Christ. And I won't find out till the end. And, and so you may want me to please you, but I'm the best pastor when I'm not trying to please you and when I'm not trying to please myself, but I'm only trying to please the Father. I hope that makes sense because I'd love for you to pray for me in that way. I could certainly use that kind of prayer. So he goes on in verse six. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. Brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against the other. So here's another thing about arrogance. Arrogance, we've seen at the beginning of this chapter, leads us to judge other people on our own standards. But arrogance also leads us to add to the truth. Paul says, I don't want you to go beyond what is written. What is he talking about? He's talking about the Word of God. Don't go beyond the Word of God. Don't add to God's truth. One of the biggest sins, I would say, of religious people you know, we, we tend to be good at not cussing and, and not getting drunk and not doing those obvious uh, outward sins. But one of our biggest sins is we want to elevate our own opinions, including our opinions of other people, to the same level as Scripture. We want to make it seem as though because I think this way and I'm a, I'm a person of God, therefore it must be true. And, and Paul says we need to be humble. Don't add to the Word of God. Don't go beyond what is written. Verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If you then received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? So here's a third element of arrogance in the Christian, and that is it makes us boast over things that God gave us, which is ridiculous. It, it makes us feel like we deserve to feel proud of the progress we've made in faith when we didn't earn that. God did it. God gave it to us. God, God, uh, in his grace, has given us everything that we have. If there's anything good in you, if there's anything good in me, it's because God put it there by his grace. We didn't do it. I mean, for us, for us to boast is ridiculous. It's folly. It's like, it's like a guy whose dad loaned him all the money to start his company who then acts like he is a self-made man. Yes, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps. Look at all I've built. Well, you know, if my dad had given me $10 million, I probably could have done that too. And that's the way it is when we Christians walk around acting arrogant. We, we boast in things that God gave us as if we'd earned them. And that prompts Paul to get a little sarcastic. And so you're going to read one of the most sarcastic sections of Scripture in these next five verses. You ready? Verse 8. Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us as apostles last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We're weak, but you're strong. We are, you are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. You would not understand that passage unless you heard it in a sarcastic voice. That's... That's part of the, the difficulty sometimes of interpreting Scripture. You can't really hear tone of voice, and, and because it's coming from 2,000 years ago and, and through multiple languages translated, sometimes you don't catch that. But I guarantee you, Paul is being sarcastic in this passage. He's saying, here we are, we apostles, and we're treated like the scum of the earth. We are suffering for you, and you who've never had to suffer at all are walking around like you get to judge us. I mean, for me, that, that's one of the things that reminds me of is me as a, a person who's never served in the military. 
I owe a debt of gratitude to men and women who fought in foreign wars. I owe them a debt of gratitude. It doesn't mean they can't be criticized. It doesn't mean they can do no wrong. It does mean that I need to acknowledge to them, thank you. You've done something good for me. These, you know, but my status as member of the only world superpower is not something I earned in any way. It was given to me. And we as Christians need to understand everything we have in, in Christ was given to us. Paul is, is using sarcasm to basically show the Corinthians the folly of their arrogance. What, do you, what in the world do you have to be arrogant about? And that's a question we should ask ourselves as well. And he goes on in verse 14. Now he's back in a, in a regular voice. This is not sarcasm anymore. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. Just a, a side note here. In the ancient world, if you were a wealthy family, you would hire or, or have slaves who would tutor your children and oversee them. You know, if, you're, if you were super wealthy in the Roman world, you didn't actually raise your own kids. You let these guides do it for you. Paul says, you as a church have lots of guides, but I'm your true father. I'm the one that planted this church. He says, for I became your father in Christ through the gospel. I urge you then be imitators of me. That is why I sent you, Timothy. That is why I sent you, Timothy. I put the comma in the wrong place. That's why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you soon if the Lord wills. And I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with love and a spirit of gentleness? So what Paul is doing here is, is he's, he's saying, I think I've earned a right to talk to you like a father, like you're my children. And so as a father, let me just say to you, imitate me. And, and let me just say, for me, Jeff Berger as a pastor, I don't know that I would ever say that to you as my congregation. Just imitate me. But this is an arrogance that Paul is doing here. He is, he is saying, he is putting the burden on himself. He's saying, I'm not just going to write you the truth. I'm trying my best to live it out before you. So if you want a flesh and blood model of what I'm talking about, look at my life. You've observed me. You've seen how I've lived. And in case you've forgotten, I sent my friend Timothy to you. He's down there now. Ask him, ask him to tell you stories about me. So he'll, he'll tell you the evidence of the life of Christ in me. And, and he says, eventually, I'm going to come back to you. And when I come back, you, you need to make a decision. Do you want me to come back like one of these pagan rulers who shows up with servants who walk around with rods and beat people to, into submission? Or do you want me to come back with a spirit of gentleness? You make your own decision. But if you keep up the act that you're, you're involved in right now, judging others and dividing into factions, then I'm going to have to come back in a bad mood and you're not going to like it. Paul is giving them a very clear warning. Get your act together so I don't have to come in a spirit of anger and punishment. Now, let me just close with this. Uh, Frederica Matthews Green, Christian author, she gave a quote several years ago that I really love. She said, every day, Every day your ego builds a cardboard fortress that humility has to tear down. Every day your ego builds a fortress made of cardboard. Uh, isn't that a great picture? A, a cardboard fortress that humility has to tear down. Humility is such an important virtue in the Christian faith. But how do you get it? I'm going to close by telling you the story. In fact, this is from an article that was in the Wall Street Journal several years ago by a former Navy SEAL named Eric Greitens. And it's, it's so well written. I just want to read these paragraphs verbatim for you, okay? He's talking about Navy SEAL training. He said, the, the rigors that SEALs go through begin on the day they walk into basic underwater water dem demolition SEAL training in Coronado, California, otherwise known as BUDS. That's the acronym. It's universally recognized as the hardest military training in the world. BUDS lasts a grueling six months. The classes include 
large contingents of high school and college track and football stars, national champion swimmers, top ranked wrestlers and boxers, but only 10 to 20% of the men who begin buds usually manage to finish. What kind of man makes it through hell week? That's hard to say, but I do know generally who won't make it. There are a dozen types that fail. The weightlifting meatheads who think the size of their biceps is an indication of their strength. The preening leaders who don't wanna get dirty. The look at me former athletes who've always been told they're stars. In short, those who fail are the ones who focused on show. Some men who seemed impossibly weak at the beginning of SEAL training, men who puked on runs and had trouble with pull-ups, made it. Some men who were skinny and short and whose teeth chattered just looking at the ocean also made it. Some men who were visibly afraid, sometimes to the point of shaking, made it too. Almost all the men who survived possessed one common quality. Even in great pain, faced with the test of their lives, they had the ability to step outside their own pain, put aside their own fear, and ask, how can I help the guy next to me? They had more than the fist of courage and physical strength. They also had a heart large enough to think about others, to get, dedicate themselves to a higher purpose. So if we want to overcome arrogance in our own hearts, if we want to survive an even more important training than SEAL training is to the Navy, and I'm talking about discipleship and becoming like Jesus, the key is to become humble. And the best way to become humble is to serve others, to think, what can I do for the person next to me? What can I do for the person in front of me? What can I do even for the person who doesn't like me? And that will get us there. That's where we start. And I think all of us know some next steps we can take to do exactly that. Thanks for joining us. I'm gonna close us in prayer. I'll see you online this Sunday at either 8.30 or 11 or both. If you're not involved in one of our Zoom life groups, uh, contact Alan at the church and he'll get you, he'll get you set up. Love y'all and uh, let me close you in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you, Jesus, you've placed us before yourself. That is your hallmark. That is, your, that is the basis of your personality. And Lord, that is our salvation. Teach us to do the very same thing. Teach us to know how to discern truth about people without judging or condemning them. And Lord, make us people of humility who follow you faithfully. For it's in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen.